This advice is the most sound I can ever give of over 40 years causing trouble and receiving it. Never say anything to anybody about anything unless you have a very clear purpose of the effect of your words. One of the things people think about with smuggling is how and, and what's involved. Just walking through an airport with a suitcase full of stuff? No, it's operational if you want any hope of succeeding. And I wouldn't recommend it, but you do have to keep a few things in mind. Who is it you're smuggling something past? It's not usually a machine. Uh, though you have to watch out for the Photon 5000, which is a very fancy X-ray machine. But if you're having your stuff thrown, th your bags put through that, you're already just about finished anyway. But the art to smuggling is keeping in mind who it is you've got to walk past. It's customs officers, almost in every case, not regular police. And they have their own ways, they have their own abilities. And they'd say to the newcomer, uh, look, we'll put you on the shop floor. You just grab anybody that takes your fancy and check them out. But you'll strike gold every so often and that will train you into a feel for it. Now that's kind of, uh, you could say, a bit gone with the wind, but it was the most effective deterrent. I, I had a great fear of Heathrow Terminal 3, because it, it was the place where the long-haul international flights, so where the peakings from their point of view would be good. And you had these experienced officers who could kind of look at somebody, like you're on one side, they're on another, but it's like two stick insects eyeing each other off. They, they have a sense of, of what um, something might be, be doing here. And in those days, I, I relied on intricate packing, but for the deeply suspicious <laughs> who only, and the experience officers would only become more suspicious the more they spoke to me because that's another thing, how you present yourself. But times have changed. We're in a modern world. It's systemized and there's always a pair of customs checkers who will, because they can't rely on any fines, the evidence thereof, uh, to be without some kind of corroborative um, statement. So they have to. People will be identified. The more advanced countries, um, when they present their passport, uh, they will check them out on the computer, they will see where they've come from, and if they think there's something of note, uh, they'll either mark one of the forms they carry, or if it's not that kind of system like here in the UK, they simply press a button uh, on their screens, which signals back at uh, the big uh, customs desk with all the cameras, this is a person of interest. The more advanced the country, the more elaborate the system. In Italy, pretty much they wreck your luggage, that's all. Uh, and uh, it seems that their own uniforms are the thing of interest to them for the very well-dressed Italian customs officer. Don't go with wrecked luggage to Japan because the neater uh, that packing, the neater the bag, the more carefully arranged the socks, uh, the compartmentalization, it should be a little sand garden when that bag is opened. And you'll get points for that in Japan and sent on your way. If, for example, in Australia, they have two officers, and they use this technique in a few European countries, in Germany, but they always somehow not get it, but here's what happens. You've smuggled some feta cheese, shall we say, from the heart of feta land, and you've packed it into a teddy bear because, well, it's nice and squishy. So you don't want teddy to be found, but somehow you've been plucked out because third trip to Fetterland in three months. You find yourself at one of the tables where Customs Officer 1 gets you to admit that it's your bag, you pack it, yours and all that. It's unzipped and he will drop the lid 
onto his hand to test the weight in case there's something packed in there. Because that was the hard shell cases, they're more suspicious than the soft ones because they can have compressed dope of various kinds in there and made into plastics, which has its own process. But he's feeling the weight of that. They haven't got time to go over everything, so really they just lift up one object, toilet bag, unzip it, yes, put it aside on the, on the, the lid side, look at the towel, maybe open it up a bit, put it aside. What's going on? What is happening is the other officer who's looking down, she is waiting for you to react in some way. A sensible smuggler, an experienced smuggler, will not be looking at his luggage. No, no, not the place to look, because you're sending radar sweeps across your own luggage, half doing their job for them. What will happen is when Teddy, holding the dreaded feta cheese in there, is picked up, looked at, felt the weight, put down on the other side, that's when the watching officer knows what's up. Because up until then, You've been burning holes in your own luggage and looking up to check, re look, react, look, react. When Teddy goes over to the safe land of the lid side, the haven, you pass through, Teddy's fine, Teddy's going nowhere, Teddy won't get the scalpel treatment, no. What happens to the mug passenger, the smuggler? He stops looking at his luggage then suddenly, she notices. He breaks into conversation. Starts talking about, hmm, hope this taxi available. <laughs> How are you guys? That's a sure sign. Any, any smuggler who takes an interest in the, the customs officer's lives, it might as well slit his wrists on the spot. The watcher will tap the other officer who was handling the stuff and say, that was it. It was Teddy. They, will, they won't even bother going further. They might. They want to torment the guy a bit, yeah, and go through the rest of the stuff. Because all the rest of the stuff will be in a back room somewhere. Okay, you've got passenger one. Comes from a non-source country. His job is to keep his passport clean. So that when he arrives in, I don't know, New York City, he can show that he's never been to anywhere bad. But this, here's the thing, the flight that he is on has been a transit connection from, might have gone through Bangkok or as it applies here, it would have been, he would have joined on at Miami where other flights have joined up with it that have come from Bogota in Colombia. You find yourself, you've got a passenger who has been to a source country, that's all over his passport, his bags come from there, and you have on the same flight, the same last section of the flights of transit passengers, the one who's come from a, a clean country, a place where um, no drugs are thought to have come from. They both know that they're not picking up their own bag at, as it comes out of the carousel. The one from the safe country will pick up the bag that came from Colombia. Uh, the one who came from Colombia will pick up the bag of the passenger who came from Europe. You have to pick the destinations. The important thing is that they both end up on the, on the last leg of that flight, so their luggage comes up at the same. The one who uh, has the bag that has got nothing in it, that is the one who come, came from Colombia, he picks up the, the clean guy's bag first and leaves. That way he's not around to be examined and checked and find out all about him if the other one gets stopped. This is not likely to happen because he's come from a non-source country. He's carrying a bag. If something did happen, well, it was looking back on the cameras, it was identical to the, the bag that uh, went out earlier, there was some confusion. He's got a little bit of a defense. So, keeping in mind who it is you're trying to convince. Well, you said that a few times you'd had to intercede when there was a problem with when you were on, an, on a flight and you were keeping an eye on one of your couriers. Have you got an example of that? Could you tell us an example of that? There have been several occasions when I've had to step out of the shadows, from business class anyway, um, to intercede on um, a courier, 
uh, making a, a misstep. And, and what I mean is that there was an option, a choice to be made that I hadn't accounted for. And yes, I might have made sure they had uh, non-metallic belts and fasteners for when they got on board, and I, I might have written it out about three times. At one time, a passenger arrived at Milan in Italy, and there is a, well, there was a sign there at the time saying um, connection to local flights. But you were supposed, if you came off an international one, go through the, the, the customs procedure first. And I could see he was heading off towards the domestic lounge. In uh, other words, he, he was trying to avoid customs. And I just got to him in time. I said, listen, you bloody idiot. Where do you think you were heading? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't have to go through customs if I, if I went down there. Yeah, oh, I think you would. I mean, you'd have about six of them instead of just one. Uh, that's what they watch for. It's kind of a trick sign. Uh, oh, you don't want customs? Just go down that way. They're all waiting for you. Oh. Was there ever a time where, you know you were mentioning the bag earlier on and the security guard weighs the open lid of the bag? Yeah. Was there ever a time that happened to you personally and you had something and you used the methods you described there to, to somehow get through? I generally favoured impenetrable objects. There's a shop in London called Taranti. It's an art store. It has um, all the kind of materials artists need, including resins. And really, the home of resins is Taranti, because not only can you make clear blocks, but you have additives for colour. You can make a very white plastic, and you pour the catalyst in with the the resin base and it sets. Uh, don't make it too big because it gains heat as it sets. But they also have metal powders. Mm. Copper powder, a kind of would-be irony looking stuff. And one of my favorites, which is powdered aluminium. Why? Because aluminium uh, blocks uh, x-rays much more than any other metal does. One of my most reliable containers was um, a radio tuner. Now, bear in mind, this is going back to the days when traveling with a lumpy uh, electrical piece of equipment in your bag wasn't such a big deal. But I would pack whatever I was taking in the wooden surrounds. And, and, and that was really uh, something that I took I don't want to say pride, but I enjoyed it and really liked to get it right. It, the final layer of veneer over the sides of uh, the casing of the, the amplifier or the, or the tuner, there is no difference really in the X-ray image of a piece of wood uh, and a block of cocaine. They, they will appear different shades of yellow. Do you ever think that the sheer volume of people that travel nowadays make either, do, do they help or hinder smuggling? For better or worse, uh, since the Berlin Wall came down, since travel became cheap, since the huge amount of um, air traffic, but it, it's kind of peaked and as we all know it's been through Covid and everything else, smuggling by air is a very relatively high risk thing to do. The serious smugglers are all just about by boat, but uh, that doesn't stop quite a bit of uh, traffic going through um, with passengers. Some Colombian friends, they really play the numbers game. I mean, they, they go through poor old couriers like, uh, well, if they can get them out of the country, that's the, uh, sometimes the difficult part. And some people might be thinking, well, wait a minute, surely they just pay off um, the airport people. And here's the thing about paying off officials. Um, the other way of, of dealing with that is to go to a trade store and get yourself a shovel and start digging your own grave because if you're paying off officials, that grave is being dug. Well, firstly, you're paying somebody to not do their job. <laughs> Even if you can get over the strangeness of that, how long will they be satisfied just with that? And not only that, the places that, where the people work in that capacity are rigged up so they can't really help you terribly much. 
There's an extraordinary amount of rainmaking that goes on in source countries, in uh, New Delhi, in Karachi, in, uh, certainly in uh, Caracas, in Venezuela. Don't worry, everything is arranged. Uh, you go to where the flight? Oh yes, such and such. You go then. No problem for you. And what's the point of that? I'd give a bit of confidence to the poor slob who's carrying the stub through it because there's no arrangement you could possibly make to ensure that uh, whoever happens to be at this particular square foot of the airport is not going to interfere with that passenger. Well, do you think the, the customs officers or the anti-narcotic squads at airports can, can have coffee in the morning and say, oh, guys, uh, by the way, I've got Blind Freddy coming in at uh, 11. You've all got pictures on your desk. Whatever you do, don't screw me up by stopping him. It'll be loaded to here. You know, you'll look like the fat man out of a spacesuit. You know. No, that, that's not going to work. Those, um, I've got everything fixed at the airport. It's, it, it just doesn't happen. Ultimately, all smuggling operations are down to people and what they believe and what they think. And there are a lot of people who probably, and with good reason, uh, avoid getting involved in the criminal world because they don't really like the idea of the people they're going to meet. And besides, how can you judge who would be good, who would be bad? And there's a couple of things to bear in mind.